Hi, I'm Max Walker-Williams, and today we are talking about the history of cryptocurrency. And being as we are in one of the oldest cities in the world, Venice, I couldn't get my blackboard on the plane. So for the first time ever, I'm trying something completely new. And the good people at the leading hotels of the world allowed me to use this wall in order to do this video. So thank you ever so much to you guys for letting this happen. And it's not the greatest thing, I've got to be honest. The first time I've ever tried it, board doesn't look as good as it normally does, so I apologize for that. But hopefully the video will just be as good and the message will just be as uh, interesting and as informative as normal. So let's jump straight into it. So a lot of people think that Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency to exist, and that simply isn't true. So uh, DigiCash was invented by a chap called David Cham, and he invented that in 1990, and DigiCash was the first cryptocurrency of significance to go live. It wasn't decentralized in the sense that all of the um, transactions were done by computers internally at DigiCash. So it wasn't decentralized. You couldn't run your own node. You couldn't run your own mine. It was all done internally. Unfortunately, for varying uh, reasons, DigiCash actually went bust in 1998. Some years later, in 2009, as a result of the economic crash and the banks sort of taking the mick and um, having all the control in a small amount of hands, a chap or a group of people, we still don't know to this day, uh, called Satoshi Nakatomi in 2009, um, took the uh, technology that DigiCash uh, used, took the software, took the idea of DigiCash and altered it and made it better. They made some fundamental changes. And one of those, one of the main fundamental changes was that it was decentralized in the sense that um, Satoshi Nakatomi and his, and his people, if he had any, um, uh, or her, and she, uh, if she had any, didn't use the computers and the nodes internally in their own computer. They allowed those to be run by the community, therefore making it more decentralized. Of course, if, you, if you're a real uh, tech geek and you know that it's an oxymoron that Bitcoin is decentralized, because of course it certainly isn't. In fact, the whole reason Bitcoin and all cryptocurrency platforms work is that they're centralized on one blockchain. So there isn't loads and loads of different blockchains, meaning it's decentralized, it's centralized on one blockchain. It's also centralized in the sense that there are very few countries in the world that actually have crypto mines. This sort of America, it was China, they banned it. So it's sort of America, Russia, the UK, and a few other minor countries. So it's very centralized in that sense. It's also centralized that the people, the majority of people that own Bitcoin crypto mines now in the world is a select few wealthy people. So it's centralized on one blockchain. It's also centralized that most miners, over 60% of all the miners in the world are owned by only 1% of all the mines. So Bitcoin was a massive jump forward, a massive revolution in the cryptographic technology space, but they had some fundamental flaws. And there are a few people in the crypto uh, community, in, particularly in the Bitcoin community, who disagreed with or tried to improve on some of the uh, rules, some of the hard rules, like the hard cap of 21 million Bitcoins being in existence, and they wanted to change that. Um, so people, so they started to fork, and forking basically means that the people took the software of the, the general rules and software of Bitcoin, made some changes to it, and then created their own coin. And in October of 2011, Litecoin was born. And Litecoin was sort of the first breakaway serious uh, um, coin that was to compete and try and steal lion's share of Bitcoin. So in 2014, we had the first and second ICOs. So ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering. In traditional stocks and shares, you have a private company which is owned by an individual and they take that public and then the public can buy stocks and shares of that business and they can own a small piece of it. So in the crypto space, the coin equivalent is they sell an ICO, which is an initial coin offering and private uh, projects allow private individuals to buy coins at a fixed price to allow them to grow the project, advertise, pay wages, and that sort of thing. Um, Ethereum raised 18 million in their ICO. So in their initial coin offering, Ethereum raised $18 million. They now have today have a market cap of $345 billion. So if you were one of those early investors and you held on to those coins, you've done very, very well indeed. 
So as the crypto market grew and we went from Bitcoin and we had all these forks, you know, Mastercoin, Litecoin, and a lot of other different Bitcoin Cash and a lot of other different projects. One of the massive problems with the cryptographic uh, technology and with the industry was price fluctuations. So there was a massive demand for some stability, pro coins and projects with stability so that people were able to predict, uh, buy coins, stable coins and use them because it's no good having um, cryptocurrency to buy things if you go to the shop on Monday and a pint of milk is one Bitcoin and that Bitcoin's worth a pound and you go to the shop on Tuesday to buy the same bottle of milk and that bottle of milk is worth one Bitcoin and that Bitcoin's worth a million pounds. So it doesn't make any sense. So you can't have massive fluctuations if you're going to be using cryptocurrencies or any other form of um, uh, money in, in real life. So, it, you know, stamps. If stamps were 10 pence today and a million pounds tomorrow and then 30 pence the day after, it just wouldn't make any sense. And people wouldn't be able to send the post because they'd wait for a price drop or they'd hold on to their stamps because they'd hope that the price would go back up and people would start speculating. And so they have to, there has to be some sort of steady... Uh, currency in order to, to allow cryptocurrencies to be used in real life. So price fluctuations are a massive, massive thing. As a result of this, people started to try and peg um, cryptocurrencies to something in the real life. So what that means is you take a cryptocurrency and you say, okay, uh, every single one of these um, at max coins is going to be pegged to the pound, the sterling. So if a pound is a pound, one pound is one pound, one max coin is one max coin, and the, w the worth of one pound is the same as the, the one max coin. So then you can, you can predict, you can pay things like you do with your sterling, like you do with your dollars, like you do with your Australian dollars or whatever it may be. You can do the same thing with the max coin because you know it's gonna have that value tomorrow that it has today, give or take very small fluctuations. So people started doing this. The first big one to break out was a, a cryptocurrency called Tether or USDT. And if you're in crypto space at all, you will have heard of USDT. And that's how Tether came about. People tried pegging um, cryptocurrencies to oil. They tried pegging them to um, a gold. And Tether pegs to the United States dollar. So hence USDT. So to peg, if you peg it to gold, for, for example, the price of gold, it doesn't fluctuate and it holds which basically means it holds its value and then it's easy to predict tomorrow what it's going to be worth because the price fluctuates but very, very slightly. And that made things a lot easier for people when trying to uh, trade or, 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 or transact in currency. In 2014, Tether was the first big breakaway cryptocurrency that managed to do this. Nicknamed USDT, it was the US dollar tethered. So it's tethered to the US dollar. So, when the, so one Tether coin is worth one US dollar. And if the dollar is worth a dollar tomorrow, then so is USDT. And it's far easier to predict and pay for stuff and keep it on an even keel because it is pegged to the value of the dollar. There was a big problem. When Tether first launched, they actually said that they would keep enough US dollars in reserve to honor every single USDT coin, which meant that if you had five USDTs, just like when you used to have $5 back before Nixon, and when the uh, US dollar was on the gold standard, you could go into any bank, hand over $1 and get $1 worth of gold. The idea with USDT was that you could go online, send your USDT in and you would be uh, returned with dollars and they would physically hold these dollars on reserve. In 2017, however, there was a run on um, Tether and they weren't able to honor all of the people that were requesting to get their money back for their USDT. Despite this, the project carried on, it didn't fall away. They, never, they were never audited and they've never shown their financials, which kind of blows my mind. There's very few industries where you get away with something just uh, so nonchalant and everyone just moves on and forgets about it. And even serious people in the cryptocurrency don't realize that there was a run on Tether. They, didn't, they weren't able to meet their commitments and they still moved forward and they still carried on. So it's quite mind-blowing. And also, despite all of that, in 2019 and as late as 2020, 75 to 80% of all Bitcoin transactions were transacted through Tether, which basically means you've got one project transacting with another project, and the other project is very, very, very questionable at best. So in 2017, price fluctuations are so crazy that they get the attention of a chap called John M. Griffin. Now, John M. Griffin is a professor at Texas University, and he looks into cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin. And he 
has done a study, and I'll put a link in the description below to that study, that says that one person managed to manipulate the price of Bitcoin in late 2017. So there was somebody that owned so much Bitcoin, they were able to dump a load on the market, which lowered the price. He was then, or she was then, able to buy up a load of Bitcoin cheap, and as they bought up all that Bitcoin cheap, guess what? The price rose back up, and then they can sell it back on the market. So unlike a pump and dump, which is where you pump up the price and then dump a load of stock and sell it all to the retail investors, this is the opposite. This is a dump then buy. So you, you dump a load on the market, it drops the price completely, you load all your Bitcoin if you own enough of it onto the market, it drops the price completely and then of what everybody else is Bitcoin, you buy up all their Bitcoin, people panic because they see the price of Bitcoin dropping, they sell their Bitcoin, more and more Bitcoin comes onto the market, they, this, this whale buys up more and more of the Bitcoin and then as they buy it all up at the very, very bottom, the price shoots back up and then they all the Bitcoin that they've bought so cheap, uh, um, uh, they buy it a, 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 a massive markup. Now, it makes a mockery of the entire industry and it robs people, um, average people like you and I, and working class people and middle class people of their wealth because it allows one or two or three or a small number of individuals, very wealthy individuals, the ability to corner the market and it literally affect the price. Now that's almost impossible with everything else. Gold, silver, stock shares. It's very, very hard to corner the market in gold because the more gold you try and buy, the higher the price goes, the more gold you try and buy. But with Bitcoin, these guys and girls bought very, very early, so it's too late. They already own so much of the Bitcoin that they can already play with the market and, and, and manipulate it. You know, the Winklevoss twins, I know nothing about them, I'm not judging them, but they own a third of 1% of all the Bitcoin in the world. And the chap who, um, who owns Binance, he owns a lot more than 1% of all the Bitcoin in the world. So he puts all his Bitcoin on the market at once and the price falls off a cliff. He pulls all his Bitcoin off the market at once and the price goes through the roof. And I'm really, really not comfortable with the one's person's um, say affecting the price of everybody's life savings. Imagine having all your life savings in Bitcoin and then the Winklevoss twins decide that they're not, no longer interested in Bitcoin and they put it all on the market at once. At, the, at, a, at their whim, your life savings fall through the, through the floor. We're now in 2022 and the world has come on a long way. There are over 16,000 cryptographic projects on the market right now and the industry is growing and growing and we've had a lot of growing pains and there's a lot of sort of murky dark history but I like to think that we're getting past that now. I just wanted to give you a brief, very brief history of some of the sort of little nit bits that you might not know about the cryptographic history while I'm in such a historic place like Venice. I hope you find this video interesting. It's been a little bit tricky to film, I'm going to be honest. I'm not even sure how it's going to come out, but I hope it's good. I hope you've got something from this. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. I'll see you soon.